Oslo. Uh, normally, I welcome our speakers who are hundreds of miles away, but as Gunther just mentioned, Laszlo Borhi teaches here at Indiana University, so it's a special pleasure to have him with us as a speaker. Today, it is a gorgeous day. Uh, the sun is bright in Bloomington. That's the good news that Gunther began with. The bad news is, unfortunately, that COVID-19 is surging in Indiana, as it is elsewhere. So wherever you are, uh, stay healthy. That's the number one priority these days. Anti-Semitism, as we all know, dates back a long, long time. And in our own day, it's become a global phenomenon, unfortunately. A number of our webinars have focused on its presence in particular countries. We've taken a hard look at developments in the United Kingdom, in France, in Germany, in Poland, in Lithuania. Today, thanks to Professor Borhi, we're going to travel back a bit in time to Hungary. Uh, and he will talk out of great historical knowledge and also a certain family connection as well to the events that he's going to describe. Um, Professor Bohr, he teaches at Indiana University where he holds the Peter Kadash chair in the Department of Central Eurasian Studies uh, a department that dates back over many years. I myself have been in Indiana long enough to have known many of the founders and um, extremely prominent scholars who've taught in this program. Dennis Sinor came to Indiana in the 1960s from Cambridge University and got things started. Um, the eminent historian Yogi Ranki was here for a number of years. He was succeeded by an equally eminent scholar, this, in this case, a literary and culture scholar, Mihai Segedi Masak. And uh, Professor Borhi continues this distinguished line by his own presence. Uh, Indiana has also been host to a number of other Hungarian emigre scholars and artists, including Tomas Sibiak, the father of semiotics, and the great cellist Janos Starker. So we have a strong tradition here in Hungarian studies and it's going to be represented today by the talk you will soon hear. Um, Professor Borhi has published a book on Hungary and the Cold War the immediate post-war years, 1945 up to 56. He followed that with a book called Dealing with Dictators, which Indiana University Press published. And I learned just a few minutes ago, he's now completed the Hungarian version of his next book. Its English title will be Survival, Life and Death Between Hitler and Stalin, 1944 to 1953. He's going to travel with us back to Budapest, 1944-45, uh, to talk about some really ferocious activities that took place there. Uh, it's my pleasure to hand over now to Laszlo Borg. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Rosenfeld, and uh, Professor Ikeri, Arvin, and Gunther for giving me this opportunity to present on my research, which unfortunately remains very relevant to this day, even though the topic, the presentation itself will be more of a historical nature. Uh, you will have to forgive me, I don't like to do this. This is not a well rehearsed presentation. I usually don't like to look at my notes or read my talk, but this time I will have to make an exception. Uh, so I will not be staring in the void. I'll be looking at my talk on the screen. Uh, so please bear with me. Uh, on Christmas Day around midnight, a detachment, uh, uh, midnight, uh, Christmas Day 1944, around midnight, a detachment of armed Arrow Cross servicemen 
raided the Salesian Institute, located only a few blocks from the 3rd District Aero Cross headquarters in Budapest. They had correctly suspected that the Salesian monks were concealing Jews in the building. The children hiding with fake documents pretended that every, everything was all right and celebrated Christmas with their peers and the monks. The Aero Cross men in their terrifying uniform carried out a biological screening to determine which one of the boys there were Jewish. Under the cover of the night, they escorted their victims aged 6 to 15 to the freezing Danube River and picked up two more individuals randomly on the way. They lined them up by the river and opened fire from very close range. Only one boy survived the, of, of the 13 taken to the Danube. Before the shots rang out, he asked the guards whether there was any mercy. He was told no. Thereupon he jumped into the river. There was no forgiveness for the Jews. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Professor Rosenfeld mentioned that I have both a scholarly and a family interest in the story. And the family uh, connection is that this little boy who jumped into the river happened to be my father. And he was the one who first raised my attention uh, to this very unfortunate and disastrous and almost forgotten internationally, definitely, but in Hungary also almost forgotten chapter of Second World War Hungarian history. Uh, I like to visit the National Archives in uh, Washington, D.C. on Pennsylvania. And the description there is past this prologue. The, the present cannot be understood without an in-depth comprehension of the past. So this talk will focus on the anti-Semitic mindset then and what it may tell us about the present through an inquiry into the mindset and motivations of eliminationist anti-Semites, the perpetrators of the crimes of 1944 and 1945, and the conditions in which they operated. These events had to be reconstructed in anatomical detail. And also, as uh, Professor uh, Rosenfeld mentioned, this research took place in the larger context of a book project on survival in terroristic spaces. One part discusses the Hungarian Holocaust, the second part, Aero Cross Terror in Budapest, and the third part, Stalinist Terror in Hungary, 1948-1953. Uh, the sources I use for this particular chapter or part of the book and this presentation are police and court documents, and to a lesser extent, oral testimony. It discusses extreme violence, and the question arises, where violence is to such an extreme that it is called atrocity, it may appear to defy description and exceed the limits of our understanding. Can these acts be understood as anything other than evil? Uh, this question was asked by a scholar who has written about contemporary atrocities in Sierra Leone, but I think that this question is equally applicable to the monstrous crimes that were perpetrated in Budapest in 1944 and 45. Now, for those of you who are less familiar with uh, the historical background of these events, so just in a nutshell, uh, the situation in Budapest in 1945 uh, is such that uh, in October 44, after the Germans removed the elderly and inept Hungarian regent Miklos Horthy, they installed to power the radical right-wing Aerocross party uh, headed by uh, Ferenc Szálasi. He was propelled to power after Horthy's failed effort to quit the war. And in the midst of Budapest strategic bombing, with a very large number of civilian casualties, and most importantly, the siege of Budapest which was one of the bloodiest and largest outside of the Soviet Union 
in the Second World War, uh, the gradual erosion of civilizational norms during the door-to-door -door fighting with law and order collapsing and even the police intimidated by the Arrow Cross armed militias. Uh, the first very interesting finding, and it's a warning for today, that these uh, terroristic units had a grassroots dynamic. As district leader Selevchin, you put it, to the Arrow Cross men immediately after they came to power and were handed out weapons. Why are you loafing around at a time of struggle? Afternoon tea parties and merrymaking are over. Arrow Cross party members have to show what they are made of at times like this. His statement shows that despite the party's severe and ferocious anti-Semitic program and rhetoric and indoctrination, it did not necessarily indoctrinate its followers to commit acts of violence. Many memoirs actually, Arrow Cross Frank and Farr memoirs refer to the fact that party life often consisted of socializing. Atrocity, atrocities were not ordered by the top party leadership, leadership, which of course did nothing to rein them in either. In fact, Josef Guerra, one of the party leaders issued a press release asserting that the party had not instructed anyone to loot or to commit atrocities. Anyone who, he added, abuses official power, that scoundrel, Bitong in Hungarian, will be shot in the head. Nevertheless, like Frankenstein's monster, the district's organizations began to live a life of their own and organize themselves into armed militias. Uh, one of the inspiring works for me to write this book, and this part of the book was Omer Bartov's scholarship. Uh, he has discussed uh, communal uh, murders in Buchach in Galicia. And as, a, he, uh, as opposed to that, where do, those atrocities happened in backward area, economically backward areas, struck by ethnic and religious strife. The murders in Budapest happened in front of the hotel Ritz. There was dif differences sim and similarities with the Eastern Front. Differences being that Hungarian peasants did not hunt for Jews in the countryside, but atrocities happened in urbanized, cultured Budapest in the historian Peter Honak's words, Hungary's workshop. My hypothesis is that the perpetrators saw that the killings as their attempt to be on the right side of their perverted vision of history and to solve the Jewish question. Having said that, Gentiles, the helpers of Jews, members of the old elite, affluent individuals, and mainly deserters from the Hungarian army, were also victims, albeit in much smaller numbers, and but the only group systematically targeted was the Jewish group. Uh, numbers. A relatively small number of radicals at two or 300 individuals, men and sometimes even women, I have to say, were able to terrorize a whole city. And that's a warning for us today. A uh, few hundred people terrorized a city of a million. The number of casualties will never be really known. Estimates range between 3,500 and 8,000 people. And this, is, uh, this does not include the individuals that were permanently maimed physically or psychologically by the te terrible atrocities committed against them. Uh, Holocaust is, the Holocaust is sometimes uh, uh, interpreted economically. There's an economic interpretation. And uh, this is um, an interpretation uh, that uh, um, could 
easily be, easy be applied to the events of 1944-45 in Budapest. And in fact, a verdict pronounced in 1948, uh, uh, in, in that verdict, um, the judge said, the perpetrators were the Hungarian executioners and servants of raging Hitlerism. The motivations behind the more serious evils was robbery and the graver part of the atrocities was carried out in order to reveal where the valuables were hidden. The identity of the victims remained unmentioned. Uh, there's also, a, this uh, is uh, a very characteristic interpretation, uh, problematic on many levels. Uh, number one, that it deprives the perpetrators of agency. And number two, it imposes a Marxist vision on the crimes, uh, 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 limiting them to an economic motive. And in fact, something that could easily be justified because after all, these people were only uh, robbing uh, the, the former uh, elite and exploiters. There are uh, there is some evidence from the part of the Arrow Cross men also hinting at uh, this motive of robbery and personal enrichment. One of these uh, guys said, we have hit the jackpot. We brought in a chap from downtown. He had 40,000 pangos in his luggage. The idea, as a man, an Arrow Cross killer called Kalman Borat put it, was to kill the wealthy Jews as quickly as possible so as to cover up where all the jewelry had come from. Uh, even later, uh, um, uh, in 1971, for instance, uh, at the occasion of a larger anti uh, uh, Arrow Cross trial, the judge said the main goal was to round up deserters and people because of their left in conviction and their religious affiliation. So even in the 1970s, uh, it was, it did, they did not say that the actual victims were Jews. Uh, and the judge also said, these perpetrators are people who did not deserve to be recognized as humans. And hence, by consequence, their acts could not be regarded as rational. But I would argue the opposite, that these were acts these acts were quite rational from their perspective, uh, and the economic motive was only secondary. So I'm now turn to the rationalization used by the perpetrators. Uh, the, the leader of one of the biggest and most powerful groups, the 14th district called Zuglo said, and I quote, the main task was the Jewish question, unquote. One of his comrades, Danesh Bokor, one of the most notorious killers asserted that he had committed his deeds as a convinced arrow cross. Material matters never interested me. I internalized arrow cross ideology, which I espouse to this day, and we're talking about the late 1960s. Uh, Josef Holosh said the following, in his, uh, in, uh, and that this is from a police investigation of his crimes. I was present almost everywhere. I saw and did things, but not for the money, not out of a desire to get rich, but out of conviction. There was a war. Jews were the enemy and the enemy is always destroyed. I'm only sorry that we did not start earlier the liquidation of the Galicianers, meaning the Jews, sooner, because then there would be less of them today, but their turn will come again. Uh, he saw himself as a martyr who was glad to give his life for the cause, but others he hoped would take revenge. Wilmos Krösel saw the struggle against the Jews as a matter of life and death. If we had not killed the Jews, he claimed, they would have killed us. He expressed his belief in racial hierarchy. He considers himself to be Germanic, a race which in his eyes stood above all the other races of Europe. 
including the Slavs. Uh, and compare these quotes uh, to uh, what a police secretary of Vienna wrote to his wife, aiming calmly at the many women and children and infants with whom these hordes, meaning the Jews, would do the same, if not 10 times worse. I'm looking forward to returning to Vienna and then it will be turn of our own Jews, he wrote. So these ideas at the time were quite universal and they almost they basically used the same phraseology and the same terms and the same argument. Ferenc Potocki lent historical legitimacy to, to annihilation. He, he claimed over the course of centuries, Jews have won, won for themselves the hatred of other peoples. Orthodox Jews, he said very interestingly, are only exploiters of humanity. Uh, if one looks at the documents very closely, one can discern the motive of the protection of the purity of the blood. The fiance of a beautiful blonde girl, a Jewish man was executed. And I mean, the fiance of, of a Jewish man, a very beautiful, as somebody remembered, young blonde girl was executed simply for the reason that she was the fiance of a Jewish individual. And I don't, I'd like to avoid uh, recounting the atrocities, but at this point I have to, I have to um, say that uh, the genitals of a certain Deje Mondel were smashed in front of his, of his uh, fiance. Or also suggesting the motive that we have to stop the mixing of blood and the procreation of the Jewish race. Jews, they said, control everything. Once they were defeated, one man claimed, we would be able to reclaim national sovereignty lost to the Jews. One of the most vicious criminals, uh, Pater Kuhn, claimed, our people have been tied up to the Hungarian people. Uh, sorry. Our people have been tied up. The Hungarian people have been enslaved. The Jews want to bleed. Uh, Christian peoples white. So in fact, to paraphrase Peter Gay, uh, the anti-Semitic Alibafer aggression shifted to pessimism, and as he put it, transformed into self-protected policy of great races in danger, namely the motive of survival, the mentality of it's either us or them. Also very interestingly, and this is um, a reflection of the uh, presentation presented by Professor Patterson just last week, the meeting of abstract hatred with the concrete. The individual could be good and be saved, but the collective is guilty and dangerous. In some cases, arrow cross men released, assisted, and sometimes even saved Jews that they had known personally. They were good people, they justified their acts. But these individual acts of clemency did not stop them from participating in atrocities. Individual Jew can be good, but the collective is evil trope, is what dominated. And having said all this, eliminationist anti-Semitism and economic motivation were not mutually exclusive. There was the element of class resentment also involved. What ties together, I would argue, murderous Judeophobia and material gain is class resentment. Jews and sometimes their gentile uh, allies or counterparts embody the envied wealthy who allegedly disdain and look down on the poor. Of course, one could argue that these claims uh, were made many decades after the war. Uh, and they, not, they do not necessarily have to be taken at face value. But uh, a closer scrutiny of the document, of the relevant document says that the main motive was the elimination of Jews in particular. Of course, there was the motive of uh, dehumanization. Uh, Wilmos Krosso said that Jews were more like dogs who creeped and crawled and in, in all circumstances, 
and grovel to get what they wanted. Juicy belief could not even be described as human. Another person called Jimeshi had started laughing and had said that these people need not to be pitied, they have to be shot like dogs. And this was after one of the executions that they committed. Also, non Jews had a far larger chance of getting out of Aerocross captivity than Jews. One of the most notorious uh, atrocities was committed in a hospital in Morrow Street, Budapest, where a Jewish woman who claimed, to, claimed that she was a Gentile was actually released at the orders of the vicious Pater Kun. All of the Jewish infirm, on the other hand, or most of them, I should say, not all, but most of them were murdered. On one occasion, uh, uh, one of the Aerocross perpetrators said, I could not understand how people could kill two-year-old to six-year-old infants. It is one thing to murder adults, other, pe uh, uh, other people killed adults too, but children? In fact, in, I have to say that uh, uh, many Aerocross people saw children as a potential threat. Uh, the elimination of offspring would bring about the final solution of the Jewish threat. I already mentioned the Salesian Institute where young uh, Jewish uh, boys were, uh, were the targets. There was no other gain, not financial, nothing except the murder of these children. Uh, there was another raid also uh, at the uh, convent of the Sisters of Divine Love in Buddha. And there the targets were little girls. Uh, all of them were taken away and most of them were murdered. And they too went through what they called biological screening. This time it was looking at their profiles to determine who was Jewish. For, uh, furthermore, atrocities committed went way beyond what was needed to disclose hidden wealth and even sexual atrocities were committed. Anti-Semitism was an immensely serviceable alibi for aggression. Pater Kuhn, as somebody remembered, murdered with raging passion. As he himself remembered, I renounced the human and the priest in myself. In fact, in 1971, in pronouncing his verdict, the judge said, before killing their captives, they profoundly humiliated them in their self-esteem and human dignity. They trod on the honor of girls and women, inflicted on them physical and psychological torment and suffering that went far beyond even the usual torment and suffering that accompanies the extinction of life. Death was almost a redemption. In fact, many sex sexual atrocities were, co were committed. A free reign to sexual desire was wound up with aggression. They mixed sexual excitement with aggressiveness and sadism. The murders were pre-modern in nature oftentimes uh, many people were beaten to death with hands, fists, kicks, truncheons, and shooting from a very, very close range. They were very personal. What is very troubling is that not all the killers were vicious anti-Semites. There was a group dynamic involved. Not everybody took part, who were, took part were sadistic. They were taken along by the worst elements, intimidation by violent dominating peers, and superiors within the group, the demonstration of loyalty to the cause, uh, which could be proven by taking part in killing and coercion by superiors who wanted to distribute guilt. Again, very troublingly, there was personal gratification involved. Some of the Aerocross men bragged about the number of Jews they sent swimming as they put it that he showed them into the river. There were also perpetrators who claimed to have suffered enormous personal anguish, but very troublingly, eventually they were able to get accustomed to killing. Killing was taken very seriously. After physical and psychological torture, the victim's hands were tied together. Armed guards, two uh, armed guards for every, there was an armed guard for every two to four prisoners who were told that if they stepped out of line or stopped, they would be shot, and they were. They were lied to, deceived, 
thought that they would be taken to the ghetto. Therefore, the vast majority did not even try to escape. The ghetto could have, in the ghetto, they could have survived. The task of escorting Jews to the ghetto was a police task, but since the police tended to release the Jewish captives, the Arrow Cross wanted to make sure that this did not happen. Very briefly about individual agency. In many trials in and outside of Hungary, uh, some of the perpetrators were given lighter sentences because the judge claimed that they were victims of the times of uh, 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 their superiors. But I found uh, that uh, they were not always captives of an abstract transcendental force, such as the spirit of the times. Rather than execute their victims, for instance, one person deliberately shot into the ground from point back range, allowing a woman to survive. So there are quite a few individuals who were able to uh, make the right choice and at the last moment step away from killing. Uh, so there was individual agency. Who were these people? I cannot overemphasize the role of indoctrination uh, by the ideology of hatred. Uh, Arrow Cross, uh, uh, an Arrow Cross program from the 1930s said, we demand the protection of Hungarian blood. The general blood leads to the cemetery of nations. And they demanded among other measures, outlawing marriage and sexual relationship with members of the Jewish race. So these people were very heavily indoctrinated with the Hungarian version of national socialist propaganda. Very interestingly, none of these people were so to say barbarized by the war because none of them had ever served on the Eastern Front. Most of them fitted back into post-war society some even, by the ones who were not apprehended, so to, uh, I should say, some even with distinction at their workplace and their raised families. Only two had psychiatric issues. Most were found to be noble and even intelligent. They at, le they at least had elementary education. At least one of them was very well educated. Two of the most vicious psychopathic killers suffered from physical disability. They all came from different social strata, although most, but not all of them from lower classes. So in fact, there is an impossible to generate a sociological rule of who would be participant of such atrocities. None of them were born killers. None of the perpetrators had been sentenced for uh, or known to have committed uh, atrocities prior to the war and none of them committed atrocities after the war. Only one of them was sentenced for taking part in a brawl. So these are normal, ordinary, this is by now a platitude, but ordinary individuals on the face of it, or most of them were. Some of them, but not some, but not all of them, had well established anti-Semitic animus. For instance, Miklos Tuboy signed up with the intent, as I quote, to kill as many Jews as possible. But the motive of social misery cannot be discounted either. One person joined up and joined the killers because he was promised a pension. Some of the people who participated uh, suffered under the Great Depression, either their own or their parents' livelihood was destroyed by economic misery. Finally, there was no awakening as if this was a bad dream. Decades later, decades later, some of the killers expressed regret that they did not kill more. Their mission, murdering their enemies, sometimes trumped even saving their own skin. So while these killings were taking place, sometimes the Soviet troops were only a couple of hundred yards late, uh, hundred yards away. And you would imagine that they would be trying to get out of Budapest, uh, go to the West uh, and, and, and save their skins. But that's not what they did. They insisted on carrying out their mission. So in sum, 
uh, the expression of a very high level of aggression was justified by eliminationist anti-Semitism. Killing could, be ser could serve as personal gratification of profound psychological need, rationalized by the defense of the purity of blood and the defense of the nation against a powerful and enemy in a demo Ross equation. Judeophobia could be justified by the opponent's alleged hatred and disdain, as well as material privilege. While the individual could be spared because of personal goodness, there was no forgiveness uh, for the group as a whole. Uh, very, very briefly only about popular reactions. Uh, Zygmunt Bauman has written that the lesson of the Holocaust is that when in danger, people turn away from moral responsibility and choose self-preservation. Uh, what is very surprising about Budapest is that despite a very large number of denunciations, sometimes fueled by petty reasons, not even necessarily anti-Semitism, but greed or even jealousy. There was a very, very large number of people who did not turn away from moral responsibility and tried to help in several ways despite the mortal risk. Quite a few of these people who tried to assist Jews by finding them fake documents, hiding them in cellars or even their personal apartments were beaten to death by the Arrow Cross uh, for that action. And in fact, it was incredibly difficult to provide refuge because of the architectural makeup of, uh, of uh, the buildings, the tenements in Budapest, uh, because of the disposition and the powers vested on the, on the janitor and the risks involved torture and even death to self and family. And as I said, despite, uh, despite these dangers and despite these problems, including tiny apartments, room and the kitchen, a very large number of people were hidden uh, um, despite all the difficulties. Uh, I could spend more time on this. And in fact, I have in my analysis in the book, I, I uh, don't think I have time for that anymore. Uh, I just want to reflect very briefly on the legacy. Now the collective memory in Hungary is very wide apart from what the one in Austria and Poland, for instance. Uh, in Austria and Poland, uh, there was the, the narrative of victimhood. Austrian national identity was constructed on that basis. In Poland, there was the, uh, there's the narrative of the martyr of nations in Poland. Uh, and, and Poland was a victim nation in the Second World War, which is called this, uh, all these problems today with uh, collective memory as highlighted by Professor Grabowski uh, uh, in his presentation. In contrast, in Hungary, the narrative was hung that Hungary was Hitler's last ally. So basically, Hungarians after the war were, were raised as, so to say, the guilty nation. Uh, that's how post-war identity was constructed. The, the communist regime constructed its legitimacy on putting the previous political system on trial, uh, the trains to the, second, the, to the Second World War and by extension to, extension to Auschwitz started in 1920. On the other hand, those small or individual small Nazis, uh, as they put it, Kishnilashok small Nazis, were absorbed of agency and responsibility. Uh, the Communist Party, like elsewhere in Europe, I have to say, recruited former Nazis consciously into their ranks. And the little man, they said, was a victim of haughty fascism, and this actually complicates the memory of the events. There was also the notion of universal victimhood Jews are mentioned as one of the many victims of, of Hitlerism uh, as the communist uh, publicist Josef Darvas put it in 1945 already in an article that appeared in the Communist Daily, Jews will not receive special treatment. Um, the, uh, and as I said, there would be a universalist approach to suffering. Nazi crimes were investigated by the People's Tribunals politicized men to confirm, or confirm the criminality of the previous regime and assist communist takeover. Defendants claimed that they were beaten and tortured for confession by the political police, which is quite plausible. I found firm evidence that they even tortured a Jewish social democrat 
uh, 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 um, in, 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 a, in one of these trials. Some of the people, some but not all, I have to say, some were good legal trials. Some of the trials, though, lacked all the elements of legality uh, and smacked of revenge. And uh, um, uh, in some cases, uh, the defendants were not allowed to call victims. And this, all of this, all, the, all, the, all of the problems with the post-war trials impedes are coming to terms with the past to this very day. Uh, after the 1940s, the closure of the People's Tribunals um, uh, trials, there were two major trials held uh, in, in the 1960s, it was called the Arrow Cross Trial of Zuglo, and then in 1971, uh, the, the trial of the so-called murderers of Buddha. Uh, there was some, there's at least one scholar who attributed political, uh, political uh, motivations rather than uh, an attempt to uh, to capture and 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 sentence the uh, those Aerocross people who still remain at large. Um, I would not fully confirm that analysis. I think that at least from the part of the police and from the part of the courts, these were very legitimate uh, efforts to establish the conditions and circumstances of the killings and to uh, serve justice uh, for these atrocities. Uh, during the war. And in fact, most of the sources of my analysis came from these uh, two, uh, two trials. Uh, after 1990, uh, in fact, after, uh, the first of these trials uh, got a very large publicity, even a book was published on it. The second one, almost none. And then throughout the remaining two decades of uh, the one party system, uh, literally this was erased from memory. And that was very much true even in the 1990s in the post-communist period. Uh, erased from memory is a direct quote from the mayor of the 12th district of Budapest. Although the quote refers to his grandfather killed in 1945, who has recently been revealed as one of the most vicious of the killers. And he has been erased from family history. And this could equally have been said about the Aerocross reign of terror. This last chapter in the Holocaust in Hungary was a stepchild of research, which focused mainly on the questions of deportation uh, on German and Hungarian culpability and the role of Hungarian political actors and Hungarian authorities in the deportations. People's tribunals left their contradictory uh, with their contradictory records, as the scholar Andrea Petter put it recently, left a deep scar on the memory transmission process and she also documents uh, the micro history of remembrance that many, many actors impeded that remembrance. Now, the situation is still very much unlike Poland. We have heard a presentation of the situation in Poland. In Hungary, Holocaust research is not hindered by legislation. The archives are fully open and there's a very lively, legitimate uh, scholarly debate uh, on, uh, uh, um, on, uh, on the Holocaust in Hungary. Uh, on, as I said, um, uh, Arrow Cross um, um, crimes were almost completely forgotten. And paradoxically, a relatively recent event gave a jumpstart to uh, and, and, and encouraged research uh, in uh, the mid 2000s, a memorial, a Turul memorial was erected in the 12th district uh, for the civilian and military victims of the Second World War, which led to a huge outcry uh, because um, uh, the memorial uh, uh, used the symbol, the ancient symbol of the Turul, which on the other hand was hijacked by the radical right wing in the interwar period and even the Arrow Cross and included uh, 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 the memorialization of civilians and, and military victims, many of them uh, who were actually perpetrators of Arrow Cross crime. So this was uh, uh, in many circles regarded as an attempt um, to uh, um, 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 uh, whitewash uh, the crimes in Buddha, which may, perhaps was not the main motive, but was a very unfortunate uh, um, establishment of a memorial of Second World War events at, at the very least but it had a beneficial effect. So the, 
it, it ignited an inquiry into this almost forgotten episode. Uh, uh, I don't want to uh, spend uh, much more time in enumerating the recent um, analysis of aerocross terror in Budapest, uh, but they are incredibly interesting um, and delve even into the gendered interpretation by Andrea Petter, for instance, uh, the responsibility of the janitors, individual responsibility. Uh, for instance, there is uh, an analysis of ego documents uh, uh, highlighting how, for instance, an anti-Semitic 14-year-old girl found sympathy for the innocent Jewish victims of the 1944 rampage. Burning shame was expressed publicly by Zoltan Pokorny, who erected this very unfortunate memorial. Uh, and uh, this uh, admission of guilt, even though it was his grandfather who committed the crime, uh, has to go a long way into uh, public frank and open discussion about Hungarian culpability for the Holocaust. On the other hand, unfortunately, there's a memento that the past had not yet been learned. Uh, the Hungarian guard uh, uh, um, uh, that was set up in 2007 uh, was using uh, uh, arrow cross symbols, which unfortunately, again, was an ancient symbol hijacked by the arrow cross, the Arpad stripes, uh, to instill fear. And uh, it, it really showed the ease with which ordinary people can be mobilized in the protection of, for the protection of the nation. Of course, the two situations are incomparable, but I have to say that in light of this past, uh, this is a, it was a very, it was a highly dangerous move uh, given the propensity of such units to start living a life of their own. Uh, and it took almost a decade to take these people out of public space. Uh, thank you so much for, for your, um, uh, your attention. And I'll be more than happy to respond to your questions if there are any.